Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from the time zone you belong to. I'm glad to invite you all to the fourth panel of 11th Annual Cambridge International Law Conference. In this session, the discussion will be on charting new frontiers in cyberspace. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce the chair for this session, Ms. Ashrutha Rai. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, where she was awarded the Cambridge International and Richard Teeth Scholarship. Ms. Rai obtained her LLB with honors from National Law School of India University in 2016. Ms. Rai later earned an LLM from Harvard Law School in 2019, where she was a Kogan Scholar. She has been admitted as a lawyer in India since 2017. Ms. Rai's research intersects international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and international criminal law. Ms. Rai's selected professional experience includes work at International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Court of Justice, and the Supreme Court of India. She has served as a research assistant to Professor Philip Sands, QC, and now serves as a graduate teaching assistant in law of armed conflict, use of force, and peacekeeping at Cambridge. Hence, we are in extremely capable hands today, and now I pass the floor to you, Ms. Rai. Thank you, Apurva. Um, hello and welcome to the fourth panel of the 11th Annual Cambridge International Law Conference. My name is Ashrita Rai, and as Apurva said, I'm a PhD candidate here at Cambridge, and I will be your chair for this session of the conference. Thank you very much to our panelists and to members of the audience for joining us from across the world and from so many different time zones. Uh, while we're sorry that we can't have you with us here at Cambridge on this beautiful spring day, we appreciate you joining and we also appreciate the fact that this format has allowed us to expand our audience to far more than it could have been if it was here in Cambridge. In this session of the conference, we will be discussing the charting of new frontiers in cyberspace. We have with us today a stellar lineup of panelists who will be addressing many different aspects of the interface between international law and cyberspace. To date, International law's relationship with cyberspace has largely been indirect. There exists very little by way of binding rules of international law that directly pertain to cyberspace activities or their real world consequences. Other regulatory regimes such as domestic laws of different countries or private industry have in the past had far more to say on issues of cyberspace than international law has. But the growing complexity the ubiquity and the increased risks posed by cyber activities to individuals, but also to states themselves, have all underscored the need to work towards a global consensus, even if one doesn't already exist, on at least some aspects of cyber governance. Today's presentations will span many of these issues. They will include dealing with larger questions such as what, if any role, international law or the UN Charter have when it comes to internet governance, questions of whether existing international law is capable of responding to the unique harms to states, to groups, and to individuals caused by threats such as cyber attacks, ransomware, or inform information operations that incite crimes like genocide. And going even further, we will deal with questions of whether responses to these threats, such as say private cybersecurity measures or unilateral sanctions, are adequate and whether they are normatively powerful enough or whether there's a need for further lawmaking at the level of international law. Coming just a few weeks after a United Nations ad hoc committee concluded its inaugural meeting on negotiations for a new cybercrime treaty, this discussion has never been more timely. Speaking on these and other issues, we have today a panel comprising Dr. Thanapat Chatinakra, a lecturer at the Faculty of Law of Tamasat University in Thailand. Presenting a paper together, we have Dr. Giovanni de Gregorio, postdoctoral researcher with the Program in Comparative Media Law and Policy at the Center for Social Legal Studies at the University of Oxford, who will be presenting alongside Dr. Roxana Radu, lecturer at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Also on the panel, we have Mr. Yuan Fang, 
a JSD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. We have Dr. Asaf Lubin, an associate professor of law at the Indiana University Morris School of Law, who is additionally an affiliated fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project, a faculty associate at the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, and a visiting scholar at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem Federman Cybersecurity Research Center. And finally, presenting together, we have Dr. Maria Vasquez Kalomula, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Lucerne, and Dr. Irina Bogdanova, a research fellow at the World Trade Institute at the University of Bern, both based in Switzerland. We will hear from each panelist, or in the case of co-presenters, from both panelists together for 15 minutes each. Following this, we will open the floor first to the panelists themselves. How I see this discussion going is that we will come back to each panelist in the same order in which they presented, giving them approximately four to five minutes to direct questions or comments at the other panelists or to comment on any of the general themes that the discussion has raised. Following this, we will open the floor to members of the audience who can use the last 15 minutes of this panel to direct questions or comments at the panelists. So without further ado, let us kick off this session with our first speaker, Dr. Thanapa Chattanakro. Dr. Chattanakro will be presenting a paper titled, Rethinking the Scope of International Law Regulating Information Operations, Lessons Learned from a Crime of Online Genocide in Myanmar. Dr. Chattanakro, the floor is yours. So first of all, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. So let me uh, share my screen first. Um, okay, so I hope everyone might see my screen right now, right? Yes. So can you see my screen? Okay, sure. So uh, for the to that topic, uh, the topic is uh, rethinking the scope of international law regulating uh, information operations. Let's learn from a crime of online genocide in Myanmar. So, uh, in my topic, in my subtopic, I would like to discuss about four subtopics. So, the first one would be um, the legal problem of the current information operations. The second topic would be uh, the definitions and type of international law regulating. Information, information operation. The third one would be international law and relevant legal principle. And the last one would be the lesson learned from a crime of online genocide in Myanmar. So let me begin with my uh, first subtopic. So uh, this is the main legal problems uh, was that the pattern of the governmental activity had laterally shifted dramatically. Initially, three issue can be considered here. The first one is subject and actor in IO. The second one would be content, technique, and aim in IO. And the third one would be responsibility for conducting IO. So let me begin with the first one. First, the nature and characteristic of the subject and actor involving IO are becoming more complex. For example, today subject and actor and subject and actor involving IO include not only state and their representative, but also new entities such as platform service provider uh, who do not meet the standard of subject qualifying criteria under international law. For example, the Myanmar army IO on Facebook eventually lead to genocide against the Lohingya. There is a problem with the Facebook that they block the IO activities too slowly. Second, the IO content, tactic, and aim have evolved as well. Today, IO content and activity may involve manipulating reality, influencing op opposing uh, decisions, and fostering uniformity in addition to harming computer network. Furthermore, the actions may not be directed at the foreign government, but rather against the individual and their rights, particularly the right to freedom of expressions and opinions. Third, the responsibility for IO may have altered in terms of both the content and scope of responsibility. In addition to international law, rules such as the responsibility of state or for an internationally wrongful act or RC by 2001 and the UN Charter nation running IO may be subject to additional accountability even for their 
intrastate activity. Um, next one. So let's go to the second subtopic, which is the definition and type of international law regulating the information's uh, operations. So from the definitions of the I.O. provided by the U.S. Department of Defense, information operations refer to the employment of electronic technique to gain access to or modify data in a target information system without causing physical damage to its components. While safeguarding our own, the I.O. attempt to influence, disrupt, corrupt, or accept the decisions making of adversary and potential adversary. So the action against a computer system or computer network that do not need a physical activity are known as IO activity, despite the fact that the US Army appear to embrace the concept of IO, it makes various alterations to the type and technique of IO, the phrase without necessarily imply that the attack might be physical or not physical or not physical in nature. The physical attack may or may not be incorporated in the activity of the I.O. depending on the requirement. The scope of I.O. definition appears to expand as a result of this. So uh, there are five types of the I.O. that I have done in my research. So uh, the first one is electronic warfare. The second one is computer network attack. The third one is uh, psychological operation. The fourth one is the military deception, and the last one would be the operation security. So let's begin with the first one. The electronic warfare is the tax area in charge of ensuring and sustaining friendly force freedom of action in the electromagnetic spectrum while exploiting or denying to it to opponents. Second, the computer network attack are a type of computer network operation which involve exploiting data stream to deceive, disguise, devalue, or destroy a computer system or infrastructure that is sponsored by an adversary. This can be accomplished by infecting the opponent computer system with a virus or by hacking into the opponent computer system. Third, psychological operations are a mix of traditional and modern techniques such as using satellite radio transmissions or distributing leaflets from plant to influence the decisions of foreign government, organizations, or individual. The fourth one, military deception, is an operation meant to sway an opponent choice. It might include activity used to intentionally mislead enemy decisions make maker in order to set a factor that it in the successful completions of the friendly missions. The last one, the operation security, is a military operations that include countermeasure to minimize the risk of adversary exploiting vulnerability by identifying and controlling critical information. So as you can see here that there are several international law involved in the, uh, the IO. Uh, I separate it into four uh, principles here. Um, in the term of I.O., despite the growing number of victims of I.O. today, the sovereign state have been one of the most common victims in the past and present. Although I.O. can be directed from the, an outside, from the outside of state jurisdictions, they harm and damage information stored in the territory of the other state. As a result, the I.O. Act violates the target state uh, sovereignty. Nevertheless, the intensity of the violations of sovereignty is determined by how the operations are executed in the violations of sovereignty. For the principle of the non-interventions, it is a vital part of the operations because it entails not only physical but also cyber interventions on the information, broadcasting and propaganda, which are the disseminations of information to persuade other states that may be mislisting through the international society to the transmissions of the news reporting channel to motivate people in other countries have also seen significant development in interventions by the I.O. For the law of war, it is uncertain what kind of I.O. would be constitute armed conflict or which I.O. weapon would be covered under international law. As with the law of war, 
any misperceptions or decisions made by the state because of the IO might result in harm, death, damage, or destruction, or destructions to armed personnel, civilian, and other property. Given the nature of the international law, the principle of the military necessity and proportionality, I will appear to be hostile to military and civilian infrastructure. As a result, the IO are interconnected to the law of war. And the last one, if the use of force principle is evaluated in combinations with the outcome of IO, there may be a serious debate about whether IO are the use of force under international law or not. Three different approaches are introduced here. First, due to the lack of traditional military coercive feature, a traditional instru instrumentality approach can claim that the IO activity are not armed force. Article 41 of the, of the UN Charter appear to support this strategy, as it states that non-military measure may include complete or partial interruptions of telegraphic radio and other means of communications. Second, the type, uh, the target-based approach contend that the IO constitute either force or armed attack, regardless of whether they infiltrate critical national infrastructure system or not. Third, the consequentiality approach evaluates IO outcome. This approach examines if the IO goal is the same as the applications of the kinetic force. If, it, if this is the case, the IO are classified as the use of force. Uh, let me begin with the, the final part of my presentations, which is the lesson learned from the cry of genocide in Myanmar. So I would say this part, I will talk generally. So I will not focus on any kind of action that I would say is a good or bad thing. I will uh, just discuss about the general uh, fact here. So let me introduce with the background uh, to you. In the fighting, uh, in the view of fighting, it is important to note that the, ju the, ju the judicial procedure and evidence referent in the international cases like the International Court of Justice or the ICJ and, dom and domestic, domestic case like those in the courts of the Argentina and the, in the United States of America are also similar. Actions by the Myanmar government official on the social media that might be termed I over highlight in 2018 uh, fact fighting mission report. You can see here that before the military operations, there are a post on social media spreading the head to Rohingya. Sometimes they can uh, they call the Rohingya as terrorists. This information has been distributed in Myanmar in many forms, including print media, broadcast leaflets, uh, web pages, including the military training of new recruit soldiers. Other examples can be found in the official page of the Commander in Chief, Senior General Min Ong Lai, with 2.9 million followers, and other ministries. Um, then I will. Uh, analysis on uh, the what I have uh, discussed before. For the subject and actor who involved in the Myanmar Facebook post, Myanmar government officer carry out the operations. The operations done by the military troop were the first component of the conventional IO. Although the scope of the IO has now been broadened to include non-military activity, the IO carried out through the Myanmar Facebook channel should both conventional and contemporary aspect Three main elements must all be examined here, the purpose, the object, and the target. So let me get with the first one, the purpose of actions. The purpose of Facebook comment and post is obviously to affect audience. However, the response to the decisions may not be apparent enough, as the audience may not have acted directly against the Rohingya in many circumstances. Rather, it is a way of influencing people to accept future actions by the military. As a result, the second element may remain uncertain. Moreover, the third element is the target that the adversary. Interpreting the term adversary to mean Facebook user is inaccurate because the operation was focused on the Myanmar people's misperception, fear, and hate of the Rohingya. It may not seem that social media users are adversary in that sense, but the truth only aim at legitimizing the, milit the Myanmar military operations. 
uh, the next one, it may be claimed that the operations element had previously satisfied with the IO requirement. The psychological operations and military deceptions are feature of Myanmar operations. There are five basic forms of the IO. Myanmar operations do not imply do not employ the electronic magnetic spectrum technology, which does not fulfill the standard of electronic warfare. Also, it does not target computer system in a manner of computer network assault and does not constitute the operation security. Rather, Myanmar operations use strategy like consistently circulating information on Facebook, including posting and commenting on celebrity content to persuade individual to increase head against the Rohingya. It would be more convenient for cleaning operations and the Rohingya genocide if individuals who saw such comment believed them enough. At the same time, such operations might be classified as military deception, which include not only deception of an opponent, but also any conduct that benefits oneself. Gaining support or non disputations from the Burmese citizen would, would also be an advantage here. So let me conclude my presentations for today. To be concluded, when it comes to the applicability of international law and relevant legal principle, regulating content, technique, and aim of information operation, including the principle of sovereignty, non interventions, the law of war, and the use of force. It seems that this principle cannot effectively serve their purpose. The IO can be carried out from outside at state territory and have an impact on the target state sovereignty. In addition, the non-intervention principle has expanded to incorporate IO which are frequently carried out in a non-physical manner. Even the present definitions of the armed attack have been broadened to include IO, the, cri the criteria of the principle of necessity and proportionality of the use of IO, for example, are required in order, to, in order for the IO to be explored to an armed attack. Also under the principle of the prohibition of the use of force to include IO activity, a definition of the term force is required to be changed. As a result, this law shall be amended to include these situations. So, so it concludes my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Chatner Krop. Uh, I think your presentation really highlighted how in many ways, factually, a straight line can be drawn between earlier manipulations of the conventional media that, for instance, international law had quite successfully addressed example in the Rwanda tribunal's Naimana case, but how similar users of social media seem to escape the net of international law today. Um, so thank you for bringing that to the notice of uh, this audience. We will move on to the next presentation, which will be by Mr. Yuan Fang. Um, Mr. Yuan Fang will be presenting on the global governance of cyberspace within the UN charter context on the main issues, methodology, and the pathway forward in this regard. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I'll share my screen now. So can everybody see my slides? Okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Such a great honor for me to present my working paper today here. Um, so the topic of my presentation today is the global governance of cyberspace within the UN Charter context, main issues, methodology, and the pathway forward. So here's the agenda for my presentation. So I'll start with a brief introduction to the background of this topic and then going through the main issues facing the global governance of cyberspace in the UN Charter context, as well as the methodology to be adopted to address the current challenges. And I'll conclude with a brief discussion of the pathway forward. So the 21st century has witnessed the rapid emergence of cyber technologies on a global scale. The internet has dramatically gone beyond the physical boundary of each state making cybersecurity a challenge facing the international community as a whole. Among the various 
international systems, international law plays a significant role and functions irreplaceably in addressing these challenges. However, it remains questionable whether the regulatory framework of current international law is well equipped for the challenges deriving from cyberspace. As one of the responses to the inquiry I just mentioned, this presentation will primarily focus on the intersections between cyberspace and the use of force under the UN Charter. And to be specific, the UN Charter Article 2.4 prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. In response to the illegal use of force stipulated in Article 2.4, Article 51 of the UN Charter recognizes the state's inherent right of individual or collective self-defense. So the first issue facing the current global governance of cyberspace in the context of the UN Charter is about the scope of use of force under the UN Charter Article 2.4. So traditionally, according to case law, the use of force of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter refers to the most grave forms of the use of force constituting an armed attack. The International Court of Justice, the ICJ, looks to the scale and effects of the used force to determine if it is an armed attack or not. And the UN's interpretation is that Article 2.4 of the UN Charter prohibits solely military coercion and does not prohibit economic coercion or political coercion. So what about the scope of use of force in cyber context? It is generally agreed that the traditional scope of use of force of the UN Charter Article 2.4 is equally applicable to the context of cyberspace. So on one side, the scale and effects test is seen as an equally useful approach in light of cyber operations. On the other side, the distinction between military coercion and economic or political coercion should also be followed in cyber context. But actually, there are gaps to be filled between the current framework and the demands of cyberspace. Given that the means used for attacks have been significantly diversified in cyberspace as compared to the traditional setting, there is a possibility that certain economic or political coercions conducted in cybersphere, for example, economic disruption in cyberspace, uh, as an example of economic coercion in cyberspace or cyber propaganda as an example of political coercion in cyberspace, this might be severe enough to be considered as a violation of the UN Charter Article 2.4. However, the problem is that the current regulatory framework is not well equipped for this potential challenge from cyberspace. And another challenge facing the current framework is about the attribution of use of force under the UN Charter Article 51. So in conventional context, Article 51 of the UN Charter prominently raises two requirements for the attribution of the use of force falling within Article 24 in order for the exercise of self-defense. So first, Article 51 demands the attributed attack to impose an imminent threat to the attacked state. In other words, the attacks to be attributed to must be still ongoing, must be in progress. And second, Article 51 requires the attack to be attributed to a state actor and only state actor, which means non-state actors like terrorist groups, for example, are excluded. As to the attribution of use of force within cybersphere, an increasing number of scholars argue that the interpretations of both the imminent threat and state actor underlying the UN Charter Article 51 ought to be broadened. In terms of imminent threat, some are supportive of the notion of anticipatory or preemptive self-defense. And regarding state actor, some suggest the adoption of unable or unwilling test where state actor is likely to include some non-state actors under certain circumstances. Despite this, the de facto status is still that the Article 51 attribution rules set for the traditional context are to be equally applied to cyberspace. But there are gaps between the existing mechanism and the needs of cyberspace here. So as we note, uh, attribution can be more difficult in the sphere of cyberspace 
in comparison with the conventional context. So cyber attack is typically featured by its rapidity, secrecy, and complexity, which will possibly erode the applicability of the attribution rules under the UN Charter Article 51. So first, the ongoing requirement is hard to be reached in the cyber context because of both the rapidity and secrecy of cyber attack. Second, the requirement for state actors also difficult to meet given the complexity of the actors involved in the cyber attack. But the existing mechanism fails to respond proactively to the challenges above mentioned. So next, we'll go into the methodology section of the presentation. So to provide a little bit background, I will uh, briefly introduce the relevant theories regarding justification of war first. So the tensions between the UN Charter and cyberspace are actually a reflection of the long lasting debates between the two competing interests concerning justification of war, namely moralism versus realism. So on the moral aspect, the just war theory evaluates the morality of wars and in which warfare is seen as an evil thing and therefore it can really be justified. But in contrast, realism excludes morality from its judgment, arguing that war is justifiable so long as it serves national interests. The current regulatory framework of the UN Charter with respect to justification of war, uh, from my perspective, is a mixture of morality and realism. But the present approaches for addressing the applicability issue of international law within cyberspace are inclined to stick to either moral aspect, which is the human rights centered approach, or the realistic aspect, which is the sovereignty based approach of the specific inquiries. So the human rights centered approach is in pursuit of the humanization of international law expecting the UN Charter to be close to the status of pacifism as an embodiment of this thinking in the UN Charter Article 2.4 and Article 51, the thresholds for use of force and attribution are assumed to be considerably high. For example, the Article 2.4 military coercion limit probably should not be altered, and the current Article 51 attribution requirement is likely to be kept, if not be even stricter. On the contrary, the sovereignty-based approach is in favor of the concept of cyber sovereignty, showing sufficient respect to national sovereignty by applying the current international law to cyberspace. Reflected in the UN Charter Article 2.4 and Article 51, the thresholds for use of force and attribution are likely to be relatively low. Specifically, the Article 2.4 use of force will possibly include economic or political coercion under certain circumstances. Well, the Article 51 stand, standard for attribution might also be lowered. But both approaches are grounded on the perceptions to what the international law should be like. Far less attention has been paid to the international law as it is. And what does the past history of international law really mean to its interpretations? So distinguishable from former approaches, uh, I attempt to raise an innovative approach. The innovative approach for the gap filling between the UN Charter and cyberspace mainly concentrates on reconsidering human rights and state sovereignty. Assuming the regulatory framework of the UN Charter as a spectrum with human rights at one extreme and state sovereignty at the other, the balancing point will go back and forth in between given the various scenarios. And the process of seeking the balancing point is exactly the process to find a pathway that maximizes the overall good for the entire international community. So the reasons why we are supposed to adopt this innovative approach by in both the fundamental structure of the UN Charter and the interconnections between human rights and state sovereignty in real life scenarios. The structurally, while the UN Charter supported the human rights ideals, it simultaneously retained the principle of state sovereignty over its own citizens. So human rights and state sovereignty considerations will be structurally intertwined with each other. And realistically, while international human rights have effected an important derogation from the traditional assumptions of international sovereignty in the past decades, the international interventions to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, etc., in the name of national interests are actually going in the opposite direction. 
So finally, I'll briefly uh, discuss about the pathway forward, which is about the interpretations to the UN Charter in cyber context with the application of the methodology we just introduced and about the implementation of the proposed interpretations. So as to the interpretation of Article 2.4 in cyber context, the determine if certain economic or political coercion in cyberspace may fall within the definition of Article 2.4 use of force, it is necessary to take a closer look at a series of examples of economic or political coercion in cyberspace. And after identifying the balancing point between human rights and national sovereignty in each scenario, a new and comprehensive interpretation to the scope of use of force under Article 2.4 of the UN Charter will be proposed. Um, regarding the interpretation of Article 51 in cyber context, in assessing the Article 51 attribution requirement, the human rights state sovereignty trade-off in both the ongoing and state actor requirements will be explored. In light of the ongoing requirement, the trade-off impacts our understanding to how long should be considered as proper for cyber attribution. With regard to the requirement for of attribu attributing attack to state actor, the trade-off affects the certainty required for attribution, specifically the degree of certainty required to meet the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt in each step during the process of cyber attribution. With the balance between these two perspectives in each scenario sought, an innovative regulatory framework uh, for determining the legality of cyber attribution under the UN Charter Article 51 will be put forward. And finally, uh, the implementation of the proposed interpretations. Considering that there are uh, many constraints of the existing implementation mechanism, sometimes we have to rely on other sources uh, as important supplement. For example, the proposal of drafting a UN level international cyber treaty is gaining popularity. In fact, the first UN level convention on cyber crime which aims to prevent the use of, for, use of information and communications technologies for criminal purposes is already in negotiation. And at the same time, the establishment of a specialized international cyber court may also relieve the burden on the current implementation mechanism. So this is the end of my presentation and I look forward to the discussion and end the Q&A session later. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think it's really quite interesting uh, how you point out that it's the same two tortured questions of imminence and non-state actors that come back to haunt us when we consider Article 51, whether we're talking about conventional warfare or cyber warfare. Um, so that was really quite interesting. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation, which is by Dr. Asaf Lubin, uh, who will be talking to us on the law and the politics of ransomware. Uh, Dr. Lubin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ashruta Ray, um, and thank you for the organizers for what is already a fascinating um, uh, panel. I've taken down a bunch of comments that I look forward to engaging the authors on. Um, so as we mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be discussing a, a, an article that is forthcoming with the Von, Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law. It's part of a symposium that the Vanderbilt Journal has put together on cyber terrorism. Um, and my paper looks at the law and politics of a particular type of cyber crime that is ransomware. So, so far, our discussion at the panel has focused on the higher level um, state-driven activities in cyberspace and the regulation of them, be it through measures of IHL or use of force under the charter, I'm going to take us one step below that in looking at below the threshold types of cybercrime activities, and in particular focus on what is perhaps one of the most devastating economically of all of them, which is the crime of ransomware. Uh, so on the screen, you have some statistical data. I'm going to assume that everyone in the room have heard the phrase ransomware at least once uttered before, given the fact that anyone from Lady Gaga to the city of Valdez in Alaska have been hit with a ransomware attack in recent years. These attacks um, hold data hostage, and the hackers demand money in exchange for the release of the data by providing a key to... Um, de-encrypt the data once um, the key is provided. 
um, these costs to pay for the ransom or to pay for the recovery if you're not paying the ransom are huge. And you see on the screen numbers ranging from 325 million uh, costs a year in 2015 to what is estimated by 2031 to be $265 billion. Um, in fact, as um, jokingly comedian John Oliver said um, in a segment last year on ransomware, it is now so pervasive that it's affecting pipelines and grandmothers. In fact, one of the problems with ransomware is that we have start seeing ransomware targeting not just corporate entities or governmental entities, but individuals. You and I can suffer a ransomware attack targeting our, our phone. And if you conduct those en masse, you're able to, to extract sufficient amount of funds, even if not everyone is paying the ransom. This is high, intensified by the use of what is known as ransomware as a service, which is an established industry within which the ransomware business operates in which operators lease out or offer subscriptions to their malware creations to others for a price, whether this is a per month deal or a cut of any successful extortion payments. So essentially you'll buy my ransomware capacities. But I wanna highlight one particular ransomware attack that I think demonstrates the future of ransomware and why is it so problematic? And that's the attack on Kaseya, which you might have not remembered because that's the problem with ransomware attacks. They're in the news for a little bit and then we forget about them. But Kaseya Limited was attacked in July, 2021. It was a Miami-based company that developed software for managing network systems and information technology infrastructure. The attack on Kaseya was a ransomware attack and that, in that sense, it was like the colonial pipeline attack, another attack, ransomware attack that happened here in the United States. But it's not just a ransomware attack. It was also a zero day attack. For those in the audience not familiar, when we say zero day, all we mean is that there's been zero days since the attack was identified and a patch was provided for it. In essence, the attack was not, the vulnerability the that was exploited was not identified and therefore a patch could not have been provided. So it's now a ransomware and a zero day attack. And just like solar winds, it was also a supply chain attack, meaning that by targeting a managing network software provider, you are not only targeting the provider, you're targeting any other company operating along the supply chain, cascading the harms and magnifying the costs and loss. And so Kaseya represents the future. It's going to be ransomware attacks that are targeting on zero days. That means that we're, it's hard for us to identify and prevent them and are causing supply chain attack across the industry. It is for that reason that cyber insurers, entities, the job it is to transfer the risk from the corporate entities to commercial providers are no longer capable of dealing with the ransomware threat because of its aggregate harms. It is against this background that law might provide us some answers on how to deal with this wicked cyber crime. But the problem is that both under domestic law and international law, our responses have been severely weakened. On the domestic side, and I'll focus here on the United States, but really what I'm presenting is true for most nations who have tried to regulate ransomware as a crime domestically. What we've witnessed is a patchy set of non-uniform criminalizations of the possession and or distribution of ransomware malware, as well as patchy and non-uniform criminalization of particular types of com computer extortion. But what we have not seen is any criminalization or regulation of the payment of the ransom itself or the negotiation with the hackers subject only to more general non-binding guidelines or suggestions like the ones that were made by the Department of Treasury or the Department of Justice. Uh, we've also seen uh, no criminalization of uh, um, the negotiations, which are predominantly done by cybersecurity firms hired by the victims to negotiate with the hackers. So in that sense, a privatized industry for negotiations and dealing with hackers who are um, um, kidnapping data has now flourished and exists parallel to the ransomware industry, and in some respect is intensified in keeping that ransomware industry alive because it's a massive producer of income and funds to that parallel industry. Um, and so it is in against that context that on a domestic level, we have so far treated this as a local problem regulated by local laws that have been patchy and non-uniform. On the international side too, we have failed to see any meaningful regulation of this. Part of the problem has already been alluded to, 
rules such as the rules on sovereignty, non-intervention, due diligence obligations in cyberspace, attribution, all of those set of rules that were discussed are really amorphously defined in the context of cyberspace. And as a result of that, the ability to articulate ransomware, a crime that is often conducted by non-state actors with some amorphous nexus to the state, are ones that are hard to crit criticize as illegal as a matter of existing lex lata international law. It is perhaps for that reason that the Biden administration, when it met with the Putin administration, this is long before the war in Ukraine, back in Geneva, the Biden administration told Putin that certain types of ransomware attacks were off the table, referring in particular to a set of ransomware attacks against critical infrastructure, which under US law are defined as a set of 16, industry, 16 industries, including water and energy, so the Biden administration essentially said, don't target those. Those are off the table, presumably because they violate some norm, or at least because that would be our red line. But in so doing, the Biden administration essentially said, all other ransomware attacks are on the table. And that is obviously an extremely problematic statement as a matter of international law. But it's not just the Biden administration. The Oxford Statement, which is a set of processes led by the likes of Dapo Akande, now a member of the ILC, um, uh, as well as Duncan Hollis here in the United States, which had tried to provide um, um, a, a, a breeding ground for development of international norms by groups of experts on regulation of particular kinds of cyber operations, had tried to address ransomware attacks. And you see on the left side of the screen what the Oxford Statement on ransomware is. And guess what? They adopt the same kind of language. Instead, might refrain from conducting, directing, authorizing, or aiding ransomware operations which violate the principles of sovereignty or non-intervention. In other words, only those operations which violate are illegal, making all others legal. Again, it's not a baseline of illegality around ransomware. It doesn't treat ransomware as a crime to be ipso facto illegal. It assumes that only certain kinds of ransomware would be illegal. What we've seen with ransomware is a massive, not just massive under-regulation problem, but also under-enforcement problem. I'll give five examples briefly of what that means. First, it's an information problem. There's information asymmetries around ransomware. Victims don't share the information with law enforcement because they worry about their reputation. If law enforcement is not aware of the scope, nature, and kind of ransomware, they are not in a position to address it and, and, and respond to it. So we need to better respond to information sharing. And that is true on the local level as it is on the international cooperative level. We've also seen jurisdictional problems. Those perhaps are most obvious, right? Ransomware attacks are predominantly launched um, by particular actors in certain countries who do not leave those countries. You might think about Iran or Russia or North Korea or China. In those contexts, the ability to hold those individuals, those criminals to account, to grab them and bring them to justice is extremely limited by jurisdictional limitations. There's also a commons problem. Um, that is the uh, classic concern of free riders. The assumption is that every actor says the other actor will deal with the problem. I have limited resources. I don't want to deal with it. So if we are all suffering ransomware and yet no one is willing to approach it, uh, and that can be done, uh, can be ex examined from the local to the federal level within the United States. So no local law enforcement has addressed it because it should be the federal government's problem. And then the federal government says, I can't deal with it. Maybe another country can. Everyone's kicking the can down the road and no one has responded to the ransomware crisis. There's also a managerial resources problem. I mentioned that ransomware as a service is now allowed to scale up ransomware attacks by the hackers, but there hasn't been an, a, a parallel scaling up of law enforcement responses. We have not seen our ability to address the rising amount of attacks and crime um, that can be dealt on a law enforcement level. And the last type of problem is, of course, the forensic problem. Those are the cyber attribution issues, the ability to engage in complex investigative activity to regulate this problem. Um, but I want to propose that it's not all law. So the last part of my presentation, we'll talk about where we can go from here. And this is um, what I suggest is the slightly innovative uh, solution that the paper recommends. And I will argue to you that it's already been um, um, adopted to some extent. So the Department of Justice 
um, in the recent, the last part of 2021 and the recent months of 2022, has engaged in more cooperative efforts to fight cybercrime on the international level. Um, and as a result of that, what we've seen is the actual decline in the amount of ransomware attacks for the first time, not an increase, but a decline in ransomware attacks in the last part of 2021. And so my proposals is only to increase that level of cooperation by internationalizing the crime of ransomware. And to do that, what I propose is that we already conceptualize res ransomware as merely a fourth generation in the regulation of particular types of crime known as um, hostis humani generis or crimes by enemies of mankind. And the reality is that every generation before us had identified their hostis humani generis and had set frameworks, customary and treaty-based, for addressing those types of crime. From the first generation of piracy and slave trade to the second generation of hostage taking and skyjacking, to the third generation of organized transnational crime, human trafficking, and perhaps most recently terrorism, all the way to what I would propose is now our fourth generation, taking all these crimes and bringing them to the digital age and treating ransomware as merely a fourth manifestation of the same problem. Doing so will open the door to a set of tools that will be at our disposal, the same set of tools that we have developed for addressing the previous crimes and were successful in mitigating their harmful effects. So before describing what the benefits are, let me just mention, I'll skip this slide, let me just mention what can be the two ways of dealing, uh, of advancing this kinds of internationalization. One can be done by a treaty, and it was already mentioned by some of the speakers and by our moderator that there are talks around a, cyber, a new cybercrime convention. Let me uh, be the skeptic in the room. I don't anticipate this treaty to come to fruition, and I don't expect that because it's been promoted predominantly by Russia as a primary actor, and the current geopolitical reality is one in which countries are not likely to cooperate with Russia in dealing with these types of international problems or reach any sort of agreement. And so against that background, let me propose an alternative theory. Why don't we take some of the frameworks that have already been created in addressing the first three generations of cybercrime that I mentioned and try to fit them to cover the crime of ransomware? And so here's a mapping of some of those treaty-based tools. Of course, there's also customary-based tools uh, like the customary crime of terrorism. Let me just pick one of them really briefly. Here's article one of the 1979 hostage taking convention. You can read on your screen the definition of hostage taking. And now think of a scenario in which a ransomware against a hospital blocks the ability of doctors from entering an operations room, literally holding the woman there who's about to give birth um, hostage by the ransomware engagers. If you look at the definition of hostage taking as defined under Article 1, I would post to you so that definition is applicable. Interestingly enough, the hostage taking convention is one that Russia is a party to. It's also one that grants the ICJ jurisdiction. One can begin to map out particular provisions in a robust way, and that's what the broader paper does, uh, including in the context of transnational organized crime and terrorism, that could capture more and more parts of the ransomware activity. So my last slide, and with that will end, will perhaps present to you some of the benefits from this sort of internationalization by analogy, building on existing frameworks to cover this new, this new crime. First, it will have an expressive function. Instead of talking about certain kinds of ransomware be, being illegal, we will begin to talk about ransomware as a whole, as a crime, being having a baseline of illegality, being ipso facto illegal. It is illegal in the same way that torture and genocide is illegal. No one says only certain types of genocide are off the table. All genocide is off the table. No one says only certain types of torture or terrorism or um, um, uh, piracy are off the table. All piracy are off the table, and the same will be true for ransomware. Second, it will create positive and negative obligations that will flow from that illegality, including obligations to extradite or prosecute, cooperate in investigations, and denying safe harbors and preventing the commission of crimes when conducting within your territory where you have knowledge or should have knowledge of their um, um, action. And perhaps most importantly, it will create new legal avenues, namely universal jurisdiction. 
the right of every state to engage with the crimes wherever the hacker is located and the ability to bring those individuals to justice, as well as an a right to engage in extraterritorial cyber enforcement action, say against the payments of ransomware um, through cryptocurrency. Now we will say that there's this positive sovereignty principle, a concept I derive from um, um, other scholars who have written about jurisdictional issues, um, C Cedric Raygard, for example, which will legitimize particular so kinds of unilateral action without the consent of the harboring state against devices located in that state solely for the purposes of limited cyber enforcement activity. And most importantly and last, it will allow us to harmonize laws, to uh, harmonize the criminal statutes of all member states in the same way the previous conventions around skyjacking, around piracy and around organized crime have created more uniform language around what the crimes were and then developing standardization of security protocols and better public-private par partnerships for dealing with them. And so the same can be done in the context of cyber crime like ransomware. I'll stop here and I'm happy to engage you in the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Lubin, for that very engaging presentation. Uh, I found your analogy with uh, ransomware and piracy to be quite convincing. But of course, universal jurisdiction is such a fraught issue, even with established international crimes. Um, but of course, there will hopefully be a way forward for this. Um, we move on now to uh, the presentations by Dr. Maria Vasquez Calumula and Dr. Irina Bogdanova. Um, they will be presenting on unilateral cyber sanctions and global security governance, and will hopefully provide us with some um, way in which to deal with all of these issues that we have discussed that cyber activities can cause. The floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for the chance here. Um, for making this conference happen. So I'm sure that, that can you see now my screen? Hello? Okay, super. So I'm in full screen mode. And this paper here with my colleague Irina Bogdanova, and we have been researching on the issue of direct sanctions for already quite some time. An early version of this paper was actually published last year by the Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law. But quite a few developments in the field of security key and international governance, as well as the emergence of new uh, cyber sanctions frameworks. So I will be talking about cyber sanctions in general, its origins, and then Irina will move forward to talk about the legality of unilateral cyber sanctions and their WTO and investment law. So what are cyber sanctions or what are unilateral cyber sanctions? Well, those are instruments of a restrictive, those are unilateral instruments of a restrictive nature and temporary instruments that are imposed against individual legal entities and government bodies that conduct or facilitate uh, cyber attacks and other malicious cyber activities. So the definition of cyber attack and malicious cyber activities in each of the frameworks that several states have now uh, vary, it's not a universal nor common. There are common denominators, but it generally there is some differences between each and other. Uh, cyber sanctions may take different forms uh, as any other type of sanctions. They include asset resets, restrictions on economic relations with sanctioned persons and entities and travel bans. And as I mentioned, when we wrote the initial version of this paper, there were like at least two cyber sanctions frameworks. There were the United States uh, 2016 uh, cyber sanctions framework and then the 2018 or 19 European Union cyber sanctions framework. But since then, the United Kingdom has followed suit after Brexit to have its own cyber sanction framework, as recent framework. So with data only uh, considering the, the imposition of sanctions by the US that have been during the, during 2017, 2020, there have been 57 cyber related sanctions. And the scope of these sanctions, especially under the US system is generally broad. And this is one of the issues that, that motivate us to, to look at this problem of 
unilateralism and international governance of cyberspace. Because as you can see from the, from the next slide, this one, uh, and the executive order 13694, which is the ground in the executive order for cyber. Cyber sanctions are not only imposed, but that collaborates directly or indirectly to, towards enabling those malicious cyber attacks. So if we take a step back, of course, we have here in the previous presentation that there is a problem of global value chains and how everything is interconnected. So our main concern was if those frameworks are broad enough, then there might be concerns about uh, disruption of economic relations among the states, particularly considering that global value chains and about are around and around the globe. This is also part of the navigation. We have heard that the challenges that exist currently at the international level of agreeing to binding international laws to regulate malicious cyber activities and cyber attacks. And of course, we also have, uh, as, as Professor Lubin just mentioned, there has been a growing incident and severity of cyber attacks, including ransomware attacks. So we look at the multilateral efforts and we have looked at the complexity of negotiating binding international rules. And we have talked previously in this panel about the UN Cybercrime Treaty. And perhaps we also share quite a, a not totally positive view about how this development could happen. Considering that Russia was the main proposal of the treaty and considering the current situation. We have also had treaties in place that have that couldn't adequately address the challenges of cyberspace. So we have traditionally relied on Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, but we have to acknowledge that neither China nor Russia are parties to treaties, and those are two main jurisdictions where that host cyber, um, cyber criminals, right? So there is a problem there that they are not party to the main convention that we have in place. So we also look at the World Trade Organization because again, we come from a trade background and we have looked at the developments going on in the joint statement initiative on e-commerce. And sadly, we can report that nothing is happening in WTO that will have binding or even definitional issues will be touched upon. There are provisions on cooperation, on cyber security, but the language is really, really just broad and really slow flow language. We have seen regional efforts taking place. We have, we know the African Convention on Cyber Security that again, from our trade background, trade agreements as possible source of cyber norms. Trade agreements in particular have um, provisions on e-commerce and digital trade. So we thought perhaps there could be provisions on cyber security, but following what's happening in the WTO trade agreement, not touch about forcible norms security. That is why we came to the, to the point to explore unilateralism as an alternative approach. And here I will give the floor to my colleague Irina Bokanova. Hello, everyone. So, um, indeed, we talked about unilateral cyber sanctions as a response to obvious gap of international rules which can regulate cyber attack, which might not only prevent but also punish cyber attacks. So, in this regard, once we are talking about unilateralism and in particular unilateral cyber sanctions, we are entering this, this field of uh, questioning whether unilateral sanctions are legal as such. In fact, um, as you probably already had the chance to understand uh, what is meant by unilateral cyber sanctions, this is the sanctions which are imposed by individual states without any authorization from regional or international organizations. So this is non-UN sanctions. This is sanctions which are imposed by states based on their domestic regulation and which might interfere with different types of international obligations the states might have. So for the purposes of this paper, we focus particularly on international economic law obligations, although I must say that other types of obligations might only be violate, might also be violated by, international, by unilateral cyber sanctions. So when we are talking about unilateral cyber sanctions and international economic law, we are talking about basically multilateral trading regime, WTO law, and international investment law. So the 
the way how the sanctions were framed in the existing sanctions framework and how they have been applied so far, these sanctions might be inconsistent with both. Some of the obligations under WTO law and some obligations under investment, international investment agreements, which exist as of now. When we are talking about uh, WTO regime in particular, um, some of the sanctions are explicitly framed in a way that prevent certain countries, certain entities inside of a country that imposes the sanctions from engaging in business transactions with entities or some government bodies in other territory of the other countries. And some of this formulation is so broad as to entail complete prohibition of any engagement in import or export transactions, both in goods as well as services trade. That's why we pointed out that some of these uh, sanctions might potentially violate obligations under general agreement uh, on trade and tariffs, as well as general agreement on trade and services. So then again, once we are talking about GATT commitments, they're more universal. So all WTO member states have this commitment. Once we are talking about GATT's agreement, it's more, um, it's more dispersed. So not always states will have commitments under the GATT. So not in all the cases, the cyber sanctions might violate the commitments under the GATT. Um, as you probably know, all the commitments under WTO law, they all subject to exceptions, existing exceptions. And when we are talking about unilateral cyber sanctions, the most common type of exception can be invoked by a state who want to defend this type of restrictions will be national security exception. National security exception is formulated quite broad in the existing WTO agreements, but at the same time, uh, it gives a lot of leeway to the, the respondent states to justify its action under the um, to justify its action under this exception. At the same time, uh, the very interpretations developed by the WTO panels, they show that um, this action should be taken in time of war or other emergency in international relations. What it means, it means that any such cyber sanction uh, that takes place, it should be explained why this can be considered as a war or other emergency in international relations. And this is a quite high standard to meet. So in our evaluation, not all the sanctions, and in fact, only tiny minority of sanctions can be justified by the national security exception existing in the WTO framework. Next slide. Um, now we are talking about international investment obligations. So contrary to WTO law, international investment obligations, they are prescribed by different types of international investment agreements and sometimes also by trade, but comprehensive trade agreements, which might have investment chapters. So as of now, there are different, they are very, they all are the obligations under international investment law. They have um, many different, they can be formulated many different ways. So for the purposes of our analysis, we focus mostly on the substantive standards of treatment. And we, as an example, we mostly focused on the freezing of assets, property, and interest in property, and how these actions of freezing of assets might potentially entail different violations of the standards of treatment. For example, fair and equitable treatment. This standard of treatment also entails certain obligations on behalf of a state under the investment agreements. And these obligations might be violated if the state uh, imposes freezes assets and property and interest in property of the companies located, of the investor companies located in its territory. So, and in some cases, it, they might not only always be justified. In particular, um, not all the international investment agreements have in exceptions, national security exceptions. Or not of this, not all of these agreements might have national security exceptions, or they might be formulated in a similar terms as WTO national security exception. At the same time, there are possibility to justify it under the draft article uh, of responsibility of states for international for international wrongful acts. But at the same time, the standards is quite high as well as a measures of necessity. So not in all the cases in unilateral cyber sanctions might be justified under the existing exceptions in the, in the in international investment agreements. 
So um, now talking about the normative value of international um, actions, in particular of these unilateral cyber sanctions. Once we are talking about the normative value of the sanctions, uh, these sanctions might have a very strong impact on framing existing as well as non-existing international law that regulates cyberspace. In particular, when we are talking about normative value, what we are trying to look at whether some of the actions of states in their response to severe cyber attacks, whether they coincide and whether we can talk that in some cases, cyber attacks or other type of cyber crimes, they have such a detrimental impact on states, the states behave in a similar way and being deprived of other means of enforcing non-existent international law. They just rely on unilateralism. And in such way, they show some sort of a merging customer international law rules. Um, and definitely our analysis reveals that in order to argue that certain actions can um, qualify for the purposes of establishing customer international law, it's very high standard to be met. That's why, unfortunately, as of now, we couldn't say that even the existing cyber sanctions framework, they can't be in any way signaling that the customer international law in this field is emerging or will emerge anytime soon. But what we are talking about when we're talking about normative effect of unilateral cyber sanctions, we are talking that these actions, if we can draw a parallel that many states respond in the same way to certain type of malicious cyber actions, they might show that there is a certain rules or that there is a signal function of this sanction, that there are certain emerging international consensus, the certain types of malicious cyber conduct and merit further response, even if this response is a unilateral. And then again, picking up on what my colleague uh, has previously said, taking into account that any multilateral treaty has a quite bleak prospect in any time soon, we might have a look at the potential of unilateral actions and whether these unilateral actions might show us some types of malicious cyber conduct that need some further regulation and that will justify um, certain response, even if it will be unilateral response. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Dr. Kalomula and Dr. Bogdanova. Uh, I think assessing the, the normative impact of any unilateral actions in international law is always so academically fascinating, although I imagine quite practically frustrating for, for those who choose to act upon these conclusions. Um, and presenting last, we have Dr. Giovanni De Gregorio, who will be presenting uh, on behalf of uh, himself, as well as Dr. Roxana Radu. Uh, presenting a paper titled Back and Forth in Global Internet Governance, Public and Private Authority Examined. The floor is now yours, Dr. De Gregorio. Thank you so much for this presentation, uh, for, for this introduction, and sorry for being late, but it has been uh, the very last minute, you know, problem today. But I'm so glad to be here with all of you. It's such a pleasure. Also, because uh, it's, it's, it's quite good also to see that in international law, there is so much attention. I've had the chance to hear the last presentation uh, part of that it was quite interesting that we have this focus on uh, on internet and the, and technology in the field of international law. It's an old discussion now. International law has also been one of the first field, you know, even if nothing has changed so much in the last 20 years, where we have seen actually an increasing questions about what is the role of, especially concerning the global scale of the internet, you know, concerning the role of <clears throat> internet governance and the role of international law, the role of states relationship and also the relation between states and private governance. So. Uh, we are we are so happy that we have the chance to present actually this work. You know, it's a very raw draft in a certain sense. And Professor and I, we are working together, and we are trying to put together just to give you a background of what we are doing. And this is why we are also not having a big slide, not having slides, because we discussed even that, you know, with uh, the beginning, and we decided that th this is just uh, to have a conversation with you to understand what are the challenges and what actually our our directions, because it's a very early draft, and we are not have concrete conclusion let's say so what we would like to do is to have a conversation and so but let's let me try to give you a little bit of background why we decide to understand to study the meaning of this paper it's about back and forth in internet governance and what we mean because Roxana and I have two different kind of expertise because Roxana is a, is a total expert in internet governance you know and I'm not that kind of level let's say you know while I have a more background on constitutional law and public law 
and we work together in different projects uh, addressing the problem in the intersection between the transformation of the internet and also the constitutional challenges of the internet. And so basically Roxanne and I came with this idea, I mean, this idea observing what happened in the last 20 years, looking at the transformation of internet governance at the same time. And we noticed that wondering why, we actually wondered that, and um, thought about in a certain sense that the internet, you know, as many other technology, if you think about it, was conceived as a technology in the public sector. You know, if you think about the, the idea of the ARPANET, the idea also the first uh, in the 70s, the 80s, the first ideas about this new network was actually created in the framework of a public realm. So like many other technology, even nowadays, think about how many public actors and states are investing in AI for military purposes or for many other reasons. So it's interesting to see from how from this framework, we have increasingly seen the internet shifting from public to private, you know? And this also came from many reasons, from neoliberal narratives coming from example, from the decision to exempt some online intermediaries from responsibility or some general idea that the internet as a new space to foster freedom should be something that it's actually outside the traditional framework of regulation, but also outside the traditional framework of international law in a certain sense, because think about that um, at that time, even in the 90s, there was not so much concern about the impact on the internet and human rights, you know, for example, or there was not just a problem about the relationship, about the cyber operations, cyber attacks that we are discussing so much, especially sadly in these days, there was not so much concern about using instruments of international law to deal with internet governance, even if there is a debate, you know, especially uh, in the, uh, the, at the beginning of this center about what is the role of international law in this field. And so the first shift, we have increasingly seen this form of delegation and this kind of transfer of uh, the, the governance on the internet from the public sector to the private sector. And this has been, you know, can be studied from different perspectives, from the consolidation of tech giants, from the consolidation of uh, other private um, services that provides different services that characterize the infrastructure on the internet, not only the infrastructure, but also that actually works on top of the infrastructure, like over the top, like think about cloud services and all the other services we use every day, especially platforms are a very good example of that, you know? And so we are increasingly seeing how the governance of the internet, not only the technical governance, but also the social governance. So the social layer is increasingly characterized by a privatization in a certain sense of the internet. But our actually, our argument is that, and it's not just our argument because also other scholars have underlined that very recently, that we are increasingly seeing uh, in a certain sense that we are going back to the public model of the internet. In this, sense, in this sense, we have different examples or different, uh, let's say, clues that actually leads us to arguing this position. So basically, this is why we, we try to call this uh, very draft research research from back and forth, because from private, we move from public, we move to private, and then we are going back to public. But why? And we have different models. On the one hand, we can see, of course, with many differences that we can address together, we can see how constitutional democracies, like, for example, think about the US and the EU, is trying to deal with the power of online platforms, for example, of some private actors, for example, in this space. So, for example, the EU is, I mean, we don't need actually to explain, but also, I mean, the EU, the last move, like the adoption of the AI Act, the question about the Brussels effect, the role of the EU as a global actor, as a standard regulator in the field of global governance and technology, is increasingly relevant in this field, you know? It be, but, but because the idea of, the, the, of Europe is an increasing idea of a public internet in a certain sense. So not of course a public internet means that it's actually state controlled like in other models, you know, where for example, the case, other cases are trying to centralize, you know, some aspects of the internet, even technologically speaking, you know, we have uh, in the last years, China, Russia, and also other organization and other states have tried to propose centralized models that have even some advantages. It's not just because they are proposed by something that are considered liberal states. So are even some advantages, but also many disadvantages. So this idea is that also we have models that try to limit, for example, the power of the private sector that increasingly perform public function. And this is one side of the debate. So we are increasingly see states that try to deal with the private sector, like public utilities, like regu with regulation. So looking at this sector as a form of public utilities. And so the question is, uh, but also we have other governments that are trying to impose uh, their control of the internet and the increasing uh, spread of internet shutdowns in the last years have raised a lot of questions for international lawyers about uh, 
human rights, free speech, whether an internet shutdown is legitimate, you know, and according to which rules, what about proportionality in human rights, you know? So the question is that we are seeing at least two main convergences in international law. One is the question about human rights and how human rights in a certain sense are also in a certain sense pushing states to say, in order to protect the human rights, we want actually to have control of the internet. Because if we do not have control, we cannot take all this information, we cannot take it through hate speech and whatever that happened everywhere in the world. Case of Myanmar, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening everywhere in the world. These are questions also for international law, and especially human rights. But since I have, uh, I do not want to spend so much time also because I was the, I'm the last and I'm late, I'm sorry for that. Another important point is the case of digital sovereignty, because most of the field, look at Europe, you know, Europe, of course, it's a good model because of course it's proposing something to address some of the challenges of the digital age, you know, but at the same time, sometimes the narrative of human rights, it's also not, not a justification, but it's also a way to propose a certain model for the internet, a model of digital sovereignty in a certain sense, you know, there's not, a, I'm not just qualifying, I'm not saying that it's good or bad, so I'm not just giving a positive or a negative assessment, but I'm just saying that also human rights have an increasing role in proposing a certain form of digital sovereignty, you know, like proposing a model that can protect human rights. And also digital sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty is changing in the digital age, you know, for many reasons, because of course the notion of sovereignty is not anymore discussed as state sovereignty, even in international law. There is an increasingly this, uh, this debate of, uh, even if I'm not, I do not agree with that, of looking at sometimes platform as a state, you know, as state actors. Think about the, the role of, uh, even in the field of diplomacy that some tech giants can play, the influence can play on some state actors around the world, you know? So there is so much, you know, the trend of digital sovereignty, what we try, these are just few ideas because we, I, we are sure that there is so much international law to dig in, to understand the transformation and the, for sure, the question for human rights, the question of human rights, and the question of digital sovereignty or sovereignty are very relevant to understand this shift back from private to public. So basically, just to recap, our big argument, I mean big argument, our argument, is that from a public model, like many other many technologies, we move to a private form of governance. And this is actually still the situation in which we are living in a certain sense. But now there are some cases, uh, even uh, in the last five years at least, where we are increasingly seeing this transformation, this try to, we are going back to the public model. And this going back to the public model actually show a very important notice, shown actually that the governance of the internet is increasingly hybrid, is increasingly shared between public and private actors, you know, between states and private actors, not just law and territory, but increasingly there are actors developing norms that are also relevant for human rights and so for international law, but are also able to develop digital sovereignty narratives. Having said that, I would like to thank you so much, you know, and this is just, you know, um, to have a discussion about that. It's like a meta work about internet governance as we are doing, putting together our expertise. And Roxana and I are so glad that we have the chance to present, you know, our arguments. It's not a paper, it's an argument, you know, in a certain sense to, the, to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, De Gregorio, for that, uh, Dr. De, De Gregorio, for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting, and I also really enjoyed reading your draft paper that you sent ahead of the conference. Um, and it, it really did raise a lot of uh, analogies to me, at least, with uh, the way in which other resources in which there could be a private interest but are now being publicly governed, such as the deep seabed or outer space, are perhaps governed by the public sphere, even though there could potentially be private interests in that as well. Um, so that was just an analogy with some other aspects of international law that popped up in my mind when I read your draft. Um, so the format that we had discussed earlier and um, which I will now follow if that's okay with the panelists is that we'll, um, we'll come back to the panelists who presented first in the order in which they presented and give you a few minutes for you to air your comments or questions and uh, feel free to direct your comments or questions specifically at any one of the presentations that you've heard or if you prefer you can also um, make more open-ended interventions. So to begin with uh, the panelists who presented first um, we have Dr. Thanapat Chatinakrop. Um, the floor is now yours. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful presentations of, you know, every presenter, like, done very well. Um, 
basically I have like a few questions to ask uh, directly to some panelists because like you know I have three uh, reading all of the paper and I found like you know it's very interesting yeah but let me uh, uh, talk uh, separately to maybe it's like not not everyone but some some of you because like you know because we don't have much time to cover every single detail so uh so my first question would uh go to um uh mr fang like you know the, the questions are that you mentioned about the uh the un charter and the article uh, uh 51 and article 2 uh, paragraph 4 of the un charter about the use of force and the self-defense um and i I feel very impressive of how you uh, put kind of new interpret interpretations to uh, the article 51 to cover, I mean, you know, kind of like any future case that might be happening in the future about, you know, the the kind of like the internet, internet like kind of that things. But uh, my question to you is that, do you think that kind of new interpretations whether it will be enough to cover uh, the future issue that might arise, in, might arise that, you know, the kind of the UN Charter, you know, is what was written in the past very long time and might not cover some issue in the future. Or do you think that it would be better to have some kind of new uh, legislation, a new rule to be like, to be used more effectively uh, to the kind of like same, uh, use of force or the, the self defense under Article uh, 51 of the UN Charter. Um, my another question is go to Dr. Lubin. Yeah, I have like two questions uh, basically. Um, the first question is that I would like to ask you is about the, uh, the, the, what you mentioned that the ransomware would be kind of like one subject to the universal jurisdictions. So I'm not, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I would say I'm quite convinced on how you mentioned on, on the issue of how the ransomware could be kind of part of the universal jurisdictions. But basically I'm, I'm not quite sure about how, you know, it, it can be, um, and it can be formed and it can be really accepted in the future of uh, to, you know, for, at least a uh, member state of the United Nations or a kind of like the UNGA to consider it as a, to have the uh, for the domestic court to have the universal jurisdictions on that topic. And the second one would be kind of like a big one that you mentioned about to extending uh, like the jurisdictions to uh, in the domestic and international court. But this time I would like to focus on the international court that you focus on the ICJ or the International Court of Justice. Um, yeah, I, I also agree with you that um, it would be great if you know the ICJ would have like uh, some kind of jurisdictions to cover uh, you know some kind of issue of ransomware. But you know, I what I understand, but I might be wrong, is that um, the ransomware sometimes is not done by state only. So that there, there might be some kind of like non-state actor that involved in the, you know, as a party to, to the ransomware. But for the ICJ, as I know that, you know, Article 34 of the ICJ statute that is only allowed for the state to be a party to the ICJ, you know, sometimes the, the state might be, you know, an injured state, but you know, on the other side, the, the the person or the individual kind of group involved in this kind of thing, involved in this kind of ransomware, might not stay. So um, I'm not sure. So 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 you might have some kind of thing that uh, you want to mention about it. But so feel free to uh to discuss about this. And my last one would go to like to uh, Dr. Maria Was Waske and Dr. Irina on the issue of the, the WTO, which I think is like, what is it very, I mean, it very in, interest, you know, kept my, you know, attention on how you link between the, the cyber attack to the, um, to the WTO law. Uh, my short, my little, my little short questions to you both is that you mentioned about the exceptions of on the unilateral uh, cyber sanctions that it might, it might be valid, value, uh, various obligations, including the um, 
kind of the WTO uh, national security exception, right? Um, do, do you think that this kind of like cyber attack should be included in the in the national security exceptions, or you think it's not should it should not be included? So, could you please like elaborate more on this and on why or why not? Do you think uh, on this question? So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So what I think we'll do is we'll continue in the order of panelists and you can address uh, the questions as part of the intervention that you make as well. So moving on to Mr. Yuan Fang. Thank you. So first I want to make a quick response to Dr. Chatina Prab's question. Um, so actually I, I, I have gone through all the potential options for addressing the challenges uh, from cyberspace. I thought about proposing new interpretations, proposing modification or revision, or even proposing a new legislation um, at international level. But taking into account the realistic difficulties um, facing the new legislation or the new modification or revision, primarily because of the lack of consensus among the states regarding that, I think like proposing a new interpretation might be the most operative, the most reasonable way to solve the problem here. And uh, so this is my response. Um, and next, I will try to provide some comments uh, for each panelist uh, regarding their papers. Uh, so for Stan and Pat, um, to my understanding, you'd attempt to argue that uh, the traditional scope of international law regarding information operations are no longer adequate uh, in order to fit the new developments of information operations. And you pointed out some specific areas of current international law that you think are most important here, uh, including the principle of sovereignty, a principle of non-intervention, principle of the law of war, uh, and principle of use of force under the UN Charter. Uh, within your discussion about the use of force of the, uh, under the UN Charter, you suggest that the scope of the application and interpretation of the use of force must be developed to encompass the wide range of the use of force, which may not be limited to armed force. Um, actually, this is an issue that often confuses me. So my question is that what are, or what should be the incentives for us to decide to expand or narrow down the scope of use of force here? What will be the advantages and disadvantages of doing that? Um, and by the way, I think the, the three approaches you introduced here to help us think about the scope of use of force under the UN Charter are really helpful um, and important. Um, and for Giovanni, um, I understand that you attempt to provide a, a new framework for information, information intervention in the context of social media. Um, and the new institution or mechanism would ideally be grounded in the UN system. But what interests me most is still the, the tension between the principle of non-intervention and the respect of human rights. And I note that you think that a lack of UN authorization constitutes the most relevant challenge to information intervention. So given the digital, digital nature of social media, my guess is that it would, be, it would be harder for the UN to authorize an information intervention than the conventional intervention. So would you think that would be potentially harmful to the success of the institution or mechanism you are going to propose? Um, and for Professor Lubin, uh, actually, I'm quite impressed by the clear structure of your paper. I think it would, it, would be, it would be a wonderful piece after completion, and I really look forward to reading that. Um, I find that you raise an interesting argument that universal jurisdiction might be applied to certain ransomware. I'm curious, uh, what might be the, the, some of the examples of such attacks that can be severe enough to be considered as an analogy to those most serious international crimes. Uh, so this is my uh, question. And finally, for Maria and Irina, uh, actually, I don't have exper expertise in this field. So I guess I prefer to listen to what other people would say about this. Um, 
But I think your advocation for unilateral cyber sanctions is generally persuasive. Uh, I do note that you also mentioned the ongoing negotiations towards a new UN International Cybercrime Treaty. Um, I totally agree with you that the success of this treaty might be challenged by the existing tensions between the UN member states and by geopolitical real realities. And actually, this is exactly one of the reasons why I found the UN Security Council and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, could be ineffective and inefficient in response to the challenges from cyberspace and therefore had to turn to other resources for help. And I think the bigger inquiry is always that, what is the unique merit of international law in a world full of politics? Um, so above, uh, I have comments for my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I also want to just take a moment to invite the audience to submit any questions that you may have for the panelists in the Q&A chat. We'll collect these questions and the panelists will then answer them in uh, the last 10 or 15 minutes of the session. But to come back to the panel discussion, um, I think we have Dr. Asaf Lubin up next. So thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll bring my questions first because I, I, I'm more interested in the dialogue, but I'll respond briefly to the comments that were made at the end. Um, um, so my first set of comments or questions are uh, for Dr. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, uh, Jatin Akor. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by your, your area of study, in particular the case study of Myanmar and the genocide there, in particular because I'm a member of a group of law professors who are collaborating with a, a Chicago-based law firm that has brought a class action suit on behalf of Rohingya refugees against Facebook for its responsibility in the genocide in Myanmar. Um, we, we've been thinking a lot about, in particular here, it's US domestic legislation that prevents liability of Facebook in this circumstance on something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. But, um, but it's precisely because of the, the very mundane nature of my study of the Myanmar genocide that I was perplexed by the set of legal rules that you chose to compare it to, namely sovereignty, non-intervention, use of force, or IHL. To me, the issue at present in the particular context of this case study is content moderation and the re regulation of content moderation. As such, the relevant body of law should be human rights law in particular, the laws on the freedom of expression and under what circumstances should speech be allowed or not allowed and how can we regulate speech online? I would have thought that that would have provided sufficient grounds for potential regulation of the conduct in question that you study. And so I'm, I'm just curious on your decision not to incorporate it at least alongside the other tools in the tool belt. Um, and that nicely leads me to Feng's presentation. Um, I want to Opposed to something very similar, which is, um, uh, I think that both Article 2, Subsection 4, and Article 51 introduce very blunt instruments for the regulation of cyber operations. And it could be that instead of looking at them as, in, in your suggestion, it would seem to be through lowering the threshold to allow more regulation through to 451. Maybe the solution is to expand other tools in the toolkit that are not as blunt as the instrument that 2, 4, and 51 introduce, especially given the purpose of 2, 4, and 51 in limiting escalatory environments in the international sphere. If you think about what the US is trying to do in Russia, in Russia, Ukraine right now, the US does not want to engage in a use of force armed attack, armed conflict universe of activities. So all of its operations and all of its actions are trying to take the shape of below the threshold enforcement and below the threshold threats against Russia in order to de-escalate the situation and to deter Russia from further action. Maybe we need the same set of tools there too to address these problems of cyber attack or activities um, and, and to what extent is 2451 really where we should find our answers, which to me, again, and that's why I think this panel has been so excellent, I think that nicely leads to the discussion that we had about cyber sanctions um, in, in the fourth presentation. 
And and for you, I, 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 your presentation sent me to read again the security exceptions of the WTO, and I kind of uh, spent quite while you were talking. I spent quite a lot of time debating with myself the, the exact terms of those exceptions, and I want to focus on two in there. One is the taken in time of war, other emergency and international relations, which you cite, and you suggest that it would not come in, in cover many of the cyber operations in question. I want to push back a little bit. The phraseology of other emergency and international relations, not public emergency, doesn't necessarily equate to, say, the derogations clause in the ICCPR. How do we interpret emergency here? And to what extent can that box be expanded sufficiently to cover at least a significant portion of particular types of cyber activities? Think about, say, the ransomware example I gave on the pipeline, which caused lines of many individuals not being able to get gas, right? Is that not the kind of an emergency in international relations sufficient to trigger the right to take certain exceptions? And then the second clause, I think another one really interesting is actually the one you don't cite, B2, relating to the traffic in arms, ammunition, and implements of war, and to such traffic in other goods and materials as is carried on directly or indirectly for the purpose of supply and military establishment. To the extent that we expand the universe of what are implements of war or goods and materials associated with it, to cover the huge universe of secondary dual use technologies of relevance for the cyber activity, are we not opening a universe of certain kinds of sanctions around technologies um, of relevance as a pushback um, in this space. I, I think it's just a really interesting kind of angle to think about uh, some of the analysis you're doing. And finally, to the De Gregorio, I, I thought it was a, a really interesting presentation, certainly one um, that many of us uh, here in the United States have been thinking a lot about, particularly around um, how to regulate tech giants. Um, you mentioned the public-private debates. Um, I just briefly wanted to mention to you, and, and I think that dovetails from what Ashruta Ray said to you at, in, at the end of your presentation, there's a, an organization here at IU called the Ostrom Workshop. It's named after Ostrom, a, a noble Lutheran who received her a Nobel Prize for her research on um, governance mechanisms, in particular around multi-stakeholder mechanisms. And what the Ostrom Workshop has been doing for decades is precisely taking all these er diverse areas of study from the regulation of the sea to the regulation of outer space to the regulation of cyberspace and starting to think about what you called hybrid mechanisms, what they would might say multi-stakeholder mechanisms for regulation of these environments. And I think there's a lot to draw from Ostrom's own writing back so many years ago to contemporary writing coming out of the Ostrom workshop. And I'm sorry, because they're located here in Indiana University, I'm tempted to mention them, but, but I do think that it's it's really relevant. Finally, I'll just answer briefly, but really I'm, I'm just interested in the engagement. I appreciate the questions, but I'll, I'll just note two quick responses. One on the ICJ question that I got um, in particular, how can the ICJ take a case that involves non-state actors? Just like in any other context involving responsibility for failures to address these types of crimes. So your failure, own failure to address torture in your territory, your failure to address um, genocide in your territory, the liability wouldn't be for that genocide, for that torture, for which the non-state actor is responsible. You will be liable for your failure to address the problem. It's a due diligence obligation for which the ICJ will have jurisdiction. So in that case, what I'm proposing is that Russia, to the extent that Russia knew or should have known that certain ransomware gangs were operating from its, from its territory, and new kind of spoiler alert, Russia knows, um, then Russia would be held liable for failing to address the problem. That, that is the framework that many of these conventions have addressed in the terrorism context, in the skyjacking context. It's not for your responsibility for the skyjacking, but rather for your failure to respond to the skyjacking once, once you're made aware about it. But I think that broader comment that was made to me, um, and to some extent ties both Fang's comment um, 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 uh, with, uh, uh, Dr. Chatting Nakrub's comment is on what is the likelihood of all of this materializing. And I, I, I think that's a fair, a fair critique. I think that perhaps my response would be, let's start with the 
club of um, well-intentioned uh, allied partners who cannot even agree between themselves. I think that the fact that the Biden administration is not utilizing this language of a baseline of criminality is plainly a mistake on the part of the Biden administration. So before we talk about an international framework that everyone agrees on, let's start with just getting a few actors who are primary actors in this space to speak in a coherent and uniform language before we then start to conceptualize how might this be adopted by all the member states of the international community. But I'll stop there because I've already spoken too much. Thank you, Dr. Lubin. Um, I now invite Dr. Kellen Mueller and Dr. Bogdanova to uh, respond to comments made relating to your presentation and of course make your own interventions as well. Okay, okay. Uh, with your permission, I will start responding to the, com uh, to the questions because basically they all relate to the national security exception embedded in WTO agreements. So as of now, we have only two cases where this um, exception was interpreted. Both of them involved some sort of tension between the state. This is first issue which I would like to bring to your attention. As we all probably hear, no majority of cyber attacks are carried out by private actors. And sometimes the problem which is often pull ups, it's just question of attribution. How can you attribute either technically, just in technical means prove that something is carried out on behalf of a state or with the state involvement or with the use of capacity or the legal question, because we have rules of state attribution in international law. In order to attribute conduct of a private actor to a state, you have to meet quite a high standard. So the attribution question is a bit problematic in the context of cyber attacks. Second question, um, going back to the first speaker, the question of whether some of the cyber attacks have to be covered by the national security exception. Basically, here we go into this uh, law lasting debate to what extent the, the clause, which is national security clause, which was drafted in 1947, actually incorporated in the old gut and then migrated into the WTO law when the WTO was established, to what extent it covers new types of national security threats. Because nowadays, I think this is, there is no doubt that cyber threats pose the same risk as any type of military operation. So, but to what extent the words which we use to frame all types of national security threats, which are war or other emergency international relationship, something that goes below war, but still poses a threat, can cover this type of new threats. And if we are talking, for example, at the cyber attack against Ukrainian power grid, which occurred in 2015, I mean, it was the first recorded cyber attack, which has a such detrimental effect on critical infrastructure, well, it left, it was resolved relatively fast, but then at the same time, the centers that were targeted, they were not operational for several months, in fact. So it, it was a significant attack on critical infrastructure. And if, if we are talking about any other uh, potential attacks against critical infrastructure inside of the countries, which might deprive citizens of the basic access to basic necessities like running water, heating, or some other attacks, then definitely it, it, it kind of raises a point of concern that it might be even a national security. It might relate to national security. But if we are looking at the word and interpretation, what I'm suggesting is it might be proved, but it will be quite hard on the legal side to prove that this is falls under other emergency in international relations, just because other emergency international relations should usually involve at least two states engaged, not only private actors. At the same time, the definition of emergency was given more again in those two WTO panel reports where this clause was discussed. The definition of emergency was quite a little bit st still restrictive with respect to that it should be some sort of threat engulfing the state. It should be some sort of action that poses a more like conventional military type of threat. And then third point is also this kind of chronological concurrence taken in time of war or other emergency. This is a bit of a problem for cyber attacks. Sometimes cyber attacks happen, their impact might last for months and months to go, but, and then you impose sanction, you say, I'm imposing the sanction in response to this cyber attack. But in fact, it might be over by the moment when all the legislative process have to go through. And usually it takes some time because, for example, the European Union imposed number, number of cyber sanctions even for the attacks which happened in 2015. So, but the sanctions were imposed in 2021. 
So six years gap. Yeah, they punish potentially. They say that they want to prevent future cyber attacks. But at the same time, we have a little bit of here um, where the from a practical perspective, it will be good to cover certain types of cyber attacks. But at the same time, what we are saying that maybe in the legal terms, the arguments might be a little bit hard to prove. But but then again, it's always a matter of um, deliberations and desire of the panel to accept some new arguments, to expand the notion and to go a step further. And if, actually, what we have seen with the double chip panel discussing national security in the first panel report, where they were discussing the situation between Russia and Ukraine, they were very, they tried to be very restrictive. In the second panel report, they became a little bit already more liberal. So at least they, they said that not all the actions that were taken against Qatar can be justified under national security clause. So they slightly opened the door. Maybe in the coming reports, if the question of national security will be deliberated, maybe they will even open it more and cover some sort of novel threats, including cyber threats. Thanks. If, if I may just add some points there, we have to also consider that some of the cyber attacks come from jurisdictions that North Korea. North Korea is not a party to the WTO treaties. And we don't know if there are their current attempts to kick up Russia after the WTO. So we still, there are certain limitations to what the WTO can do and cannot do. But then I would just like to also provide some comments to, to, to the question or to the very thoughtful remark from Yuan Fan about what is the unique merit of international law in a world of real politics. And that is, that is actually our starting point, right? We are looking at international economic relations and our point was to look at it through the through cyber sanctions, perhaps as an instrument of real politics. But then we grow more uh, hopeful that cyber sanctions, albeit unilateral, can signal those red lines in the cyberspace. And that's why we think it's very important to look at state practice regarding unilateral cyber sanctions. And then uh, perhaps our, our hopes increase when we look at other types of instruments that also arise out of unilateral practice. And then we know that the missile technology control regime also grew out of unilateral practices. Um, so there is certain hope on unilateralism leading to perhaps consensus building. And uh, and maybe this is a very hopeful thought in the current times, but there is still the possibility. I have a few comments to all the great panelists, and perhaps if I may just also ask uh, you and Fang about this proposition of establishing uh, international cyber court. You know, we in international law we often talk about fragmentation, and the different tribunals will often. There is a risk of fragmentation of international law. So have you considered that point of view when thinking about establishing a, another new international court? And I also have a comment for Dr. De Gregorio. Uh, when, when I read the, the paper that you submitted, then uh, there were, it was very striking to me that, of course, you are trying to make the argument that there is a, a not a conflict, but a division between the regulation of the internet in liberal states and the regulation of the internet in illiberal states, right? Uh, and when I think about it, uh, when I think about an illiberal state in the, in the terms of human rights, I think about China, but the paper is mainly focused on the EU regulation of internet. And the equation that you bring here when you talk about the EU is the human rights, versus digital sovereignty or human rights and digital sovereignty approach and digital sovereignty and enabling human rights, right? Is there another element in that equation if you will talk about illiberal regimes also trying to establish digital sovereignty, for instance, China? And then I'm thinking about the, the typical argument that we hear now very often is economic security, technological security, and just mere resilience in terms of um, again, in terms of real politic, the resilience in how they are connected to the world. So I thought this is perhaps a, a point of view that you might consider when working on the paper. And well, I thank you all of you for your wonderful comments. And I thank you, Dina, also for taking out the national security issue. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. De Gregorio, I'll allow you to respond to the comments that have been directed at you as well as make your own. Yeah, 
Thank you so much. I mean, that I, if I'm not wrong, we are already running out of time. So I will try to be very, very brief, you know. So first of all, I have different comments because, it, uh, sorry, I know that it was late today, but I, of course I have uh, read, of course, the draft and every, everything was really, really interesting in terms of what, what I can see is like an horizontal comment, you know, since we do not have so much time. I've seen reading the paper, you know, that we address so many different angles of how international law is so much intertwined with the discussion about the... I mean, the cyberspace is now an old word, an old expression, but like the internet or the governance, the internet governance, because it was, it's very interesting, of course, the paper, of course, the question of ransomware, because uh, it's, it's a very, uh, it seems a small topic, but it will be increasingly a problematic, especially when states will be subject to this problem, you know, and so it will be a kind of retaliation. So it's very relevant for international law, international relationships. So, I, and this is very, very interesting for a question of international law, but also the other paper asking, of course, the problem of cyber operation. Now there are books about these things, you know, so it's crazy. So because um, increasingly cyber attacks, the part even from my research, even cyber attacks are also reason for countermeasures and self-defense on the other side. So there are reasons for international law also to say that maybe if you actually rely on a cyber attack, you can also reply with an internet shutdown just to protect your technical infrastructure, for example. Maybe, maybe it's a question that we can think about. What is the reaction of self-defense what kind of legitimation or what kind of measure are justified, you know, in case of a, like a cyber operation or cyber attack. So and definitely this is another part of the debate relevant part. I see that there are also other pieces of the presentation were really, really interesting, but I don't want to take time because uh, I mean, uh, there have been also other questions around the question of intervention, of course, are relevant. Of course, it's part of another part of my research about the question about how we manage the new forms of intervention in terms of war, in terms of conflicts, and another part of the important topic. And it's quite interesting to see how, uh, in a certain sense, my part complemented and part, uh, slightly the part in human rights of it. So I see, uh, in a certain sense, I, it was quite uh, interesting because you see the different parts of international law coming here in this uh, big case study of technology. So I was really glad to have the chance to, to share with you these ideas. And just uh, very, very briefly, because I want also to answer to Maria, thanks for the comment, you know, uh, because we have not so much time also just all the other points. It's definitely, you're definitely right. We are struggling, of course, always to classify things because it's very difficult to classify things in this case. Um, since uh, it's a very draft, you know, we try to start from Europe as a case, you know, to show how this, our arguments actually work in the last actually 20 years that we have this back and forth because Europe is a good example. Uh, but uh, even the US or China or other cases are good examples, but the characteristics of this back and forth are a little bit different. If you think about the, um, for China, it's a little bit different because now we had public, then uh, uh, we have an increasing exportation of some values also through new tech giants like TikTok at the same time, even it's very much, you know, Western kind of Western reflective values, you know, so at the same time. So it's interesting to study this topic. We're starting from the EU because it's, it, we, we thought it's very close to our, you know, to our argument also to think maybe to restrict the focus to the EU as a model to shift to explain this back and forth. But there are also other interesting examples showing uh, how, what exactly you're saying. There are so many other reasons, so many other justification for uh, the shift from private to public, or generally speaking for some models that have still been public even in the last 20 years, you know, it have been very, very public in terms of control, I mean, you know. So this, I think that of course, uh, Europe uh, is kind of an example and we'll try probably uh, probably to focus on Europe as an example, but just to consolidate uh, the idea and try to see whether this idea, this, I mean, this idea and our argument, of course, we have already tried to apply to different frameworks, apply also to, the, to, to other, you know, approaches to digital sovereignty. So this is actually our idea. Um, and, uh, but we believe that Europe, it's, it's a very interesting example, but also the US in a certain sense, there is now very, very slowly this, try and uh, discussion about how we can govern the private side of the internet. It's very different from the EU, but there is a slow move to have this conversation also on the other side of the Atlantic. So, but the question is still open. There are different models of digital sovereignty. So thank you so much for all your comments. It's been a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. De Gregorio. Uh, we'll just take two audience questions before we close. Uh, the first one is directed at uh, Dr. Asaf Lubin, and the question is, um, why is ransomware not an international criminal offense as yet? And if it's, a if it's a question of a lack of political will, then will this proposed expansion necessarily even work? 
um, I'll let you answer that first. Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned in my presentation the Oxford process, and in that Oxford process, I was trying to persuade, we're not even talking about the Russia or China or North Korea, I was trying to persuade other American law professors here in the United States about the need to create a baseline of illegality for ransomware. And the reason why the Oxford process ultimately did not adopt a baseline of illegality, but instead used the terminology that I indicated in my presentation, the one that says ransomware is illegal when it violates, when it constitutes, when it is against the rights and interests of other, whatever the phrase is, is because people on the call were unsure of whether or not we want to set ransomware as an illegit illegitimate practice with where they, they put the question back to me and as to whether the US might ever want to engage in ransomware itself. This is true for all of cyberspace. Every time we try to propose a regulation of particular kinds of cyber activities, the pushback is always, but if we prohibit it, then we'll also prohibit it on our own. And given that we want to engage with as much flexibility as possible for the purposes of self-help as an enforcement tool in this space, it's better not to prohibit all to leave enough leeway for the possibility that in the future, we might want to engage in the practice ourselves. And so I, my so, so in that sense, yes, it's political will, but my response would be to try and persuade people in the way I did in my presentation, the way I'll do in my paper, that it is the case that certain kinds of cyber activities should be ipso facto illegal, that we should be able to set clearer lines of certain types of cyber behavior that should be unacceptable. And that um, it doesn't matter if you're a US or a Russia, you should not be engaging in certain kinds of activities. In this case, the use of extortion against individuals or corporations to ad advance political ideology or private gains. Um, and so that would be my, 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 my response, but, but, um, but it's an ongoing conversation and you'll, you will perhaps be surprised that some push back on, on that uh, premise. Thank you. Um, the second question is, uh, I believe, primarily directed at Drs. Kalamula and Dr. Bogdanova, and it uh, pertains to how, on the topic of the WTO security exception, how the Russia transport in transit would help clarify whether Myanmar can self-justify the use of social media in their information operations. Um, I believe this pertains to uh, the presentation made by Drs. Kalamula and Bogdanova, but also touches upon some aspects of the presentation made by Dr. Chetan Akrov. Um, if either of you, if, if any of you would like to uh, answer this question, I'm happy to cede the floor to whichever one of you feels best equipped to deal with this question. Um, uh, can you repeat the question please one more time? Because I assume it's kind of part to us, part to the first speaker. Yeah, but I'll, I'll yeah. yeah, sure. I'll read it out again. Uh, open quotes on the topic of the WTO security exception. How would quote unquote Russia transport in transit help clarify whether Myanmar can self justify the use of social media in their operations? Um, I, I, I think it's um, a little bit complicated question because the Russia traffic in transit was the first WTO dispute where the national security exception was interpreted. So it was the first time that the respondent state invoked national security exception in particular article 21b3 of the GUT to justify its restrictions. So in the WTO panel Russia traffic in transit, there was a tension between the states, Russia prohibited uh, use of um, part of its territory for Ukraine to use this route for transiting its goods. And that's why when the case went to the panel, um, um, the panel decided that this, because of the tension between the countries and because there were some even general assembly resolutions confirming that there is certain kind of military tension between the countries, it, these restrictions were justified. With respect, if we are talking about information operation, um, with respect to the genocide in Myanmar, I think the first question will be if there is violation of WTO law, 
So this is the first question. So if it's WTO dispute, if it's WTO dispute, then there should be some sort of violation of WTO law. If it goes to that stage and there is a violation and panel decides that there is violation, then respondent has a chance to invoke as a justification national security clause. So if there will be some sort of, a, I'm just couldn't pick up with any kind of a violation in the WTO context with respect to this kind of misinformation campaign or some sort of op operation, which might be, it might be maybe involved, involved in some sort of trade and services, but it's kind of, I don't have enough facts on the ground to assume any violation of even, because GATS uh, that regulates trade and services also has national security exception, which is similar to the GATT text. So if there is a violation, uh, and then the, the panel might, the respondent might invoke national security exception, and, and then the panel will have to decide if it's justified or not justified. So as always like with the WTO law, it's self-contained regime. So it has its own rules. If you violate the rules, you can invoke only the exceptions which exist in the uh, in the context of WTO agreements. So you couldn't rely on public international law to justify its action. That's that's the issue with a multilateral trading system as it stands today. Although in the context of uh, appellate body crisis, the more we hear these days is that uh, countries can go and unilaterally use countermeasures because their uh, existing system of disrespect settlement is, um, is not functional. So it doesn't function as it was um, expected to function in 1995. So that's why the more we hear is the voices of reliance on public international law, but again, it's not kind of well, agreed by all the double two members as of now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chatanakrob, if there's anything that you would like to add to that, if not, I'm happy to close the discussion. Um, maybe a bit about, you know, the further questions you know, uh, of like uh, the whether Myanmar can self justify the use of social media in their operations. So I would be this kind of thing, uh, this kind of like, you know, the, the Myanmar, you know, people for, for, the, for the people, for the government who done like the information operations, they would say that, okay, they won't say, they won't try to be tied to say that, okay, this is not our operations or the kind of thing. But uh, what I want to what I want to say is that the information that I, I put in my presentation is uh has been uh, it is like an input from the you know the UN for fighting um, missions in Myanmar in 2018 with I think it's like you know it's it's kind of thing that you know the other people have to tell whether kind of the operations you know is an IO or not. It's not that of it's not the things like the, the Myanmar should bring on themselves that, okay, we don't do kind of the, of the information operation in that part. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chatnakrab, and thank you to all of the panelists for your excellent presentations and for engaging with all of the comments and for commenting on everybody else's presentations as well. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to this discussion and uh, I'll now hand over the mic to Tejas to close today's session of the conference. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Ashrita, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for a fantastic discussion on cyberspace. I think you've wrapped up day one in the best way possible for us at the 11th Annual Cambridge International Law Conference. To our audience, thank you very much for tuning in throughout the day. It's been fascinating to see your engagement with all of these panelists' papers as well as the kind of fruitful academic engagement that we envisage actually taking place. We're hopeful that that means that the 11, that volume 11 2 of the Cambridge International Law Journal produces high quality articles when they are submitted or uh, when, when the deadline opens up next week. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, a couple of quick notices. We will be starting the day tomorrow at 8 a.m. British summer time as the clocks go forward in the United Kingdom overnight. So the entire program is running one hour later than it was today if you are joining us tomorrow. Uh, please consider this a warm invitation for tomorrow morning's opening keynote address to be delivered by Ms. Maya Groff, chaired by Dr. Marcus Gehring, following which we've got four excellent panels and a closing keynote by Professor Ernst Ulrich Petersman. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.